So we came to visit and I completely fell in love, just the size of the city, the rolling, you know, it kind of reminds me of actually my hometown Gondor in Ethiopia. That was Radio Africa owner and chef, Eskinder Azaged. Welcome to Storied San Francisco. I'm your host, Jeff Hunt. This episode kicks off Small Business September for us here on the podcast. In it, Eskinder shares the tale of a teenage boy and his brother leaving their communist home country of Ethiopia on foot for Sudan. They eventually received refugee status from the U.S. and moved to New York City, where Eskinder found work as a busboy at the U.N. building. But a trip to San Francisco with his girlfriend ended up changing his life. He moved here in 1986 and worked at a number of restaurants, which he talks about in the episode. Here's Eskinder. I mean, the, the Ethiopia part, since I, I've only lived about 18 and a half years or... I left Ethiopia at the age of 19, I should say, okay. uh, was very minimal. You know, Ethiopia uh, being uh, sort of a closed country, uh, also closely knit culture, we were really not exposed to the outside world. So, uh, um, where, right in, up, where in Ethiopia? Where Gondor, you? Okay. the northern part of it, okay. northeastern kind of. And um, growing up, we have... Pretty much the, the pretty simple life. Uh, all the stories were just uh, either recycled, evolved uh, from Ethiopia, and um, and um, I left when, right after I finished high school because Ethiopia used to be a communist country, and uh, basically all the young people, including myself, weren't participating in what the, you know, the uh, government was doing to Ethiopia. So basically we were forced out. We walked out of Ethiopia, me, my brother, and a couple of other friends. Literally walked exactly. out? Exactly. Okay. Walked out of Ethiopia. And where did you go? Uh, uh, to Sudan. Okay. Which is uh, it's to the eastern part, yeah. Right. And. Um, was yeah, that scary to the western, for you? To the western part. Pardon me? Was that scary for you? Very scary. Yeah. Well, number one, number one, it's scary physically, you know, because we don't know where we're going. And then uh, number two, which is more dangerous, is if we got caught by the government, uh, you could be put in jail for, you know, in prison, or you could be, get, you know, you could get killed. Right. So, but, you know, at a young age, we were so, you know, driven. There's no, you know, um, Second thinking about when it comes to uh, you know safety, what we wanted to do, we weren't in support of the communist government. We walked out of there. I think it took us uh, something around two weeks. I don't remember wow. exactly. And then we got an asylum in Sudan, okay. and uh, in Sudan I lived for about a little over four years. Okay. And what was your life in in Sudan? What did you when you got there? What did you do? Sudan, some miscellaneous stuff. My first job there was uh, uh, an ice delivery. Uh, Sudan is a very hot country, so yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, ice delivery person uh, in Gadarif, which mm -hmm. is uh, the first kind of big city, you know, when you arrive in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I didn't stay in Gadarif, uh, uh, moved to Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. Mm -hmm. I think uh, after maybe six or eight months, and then that's where a sort of I thrived a little bit because uh, you know it's a bigger city. Uh, there were a lot of other young people, uh, uh, young people from all over. In fact, you know, from um, some from other countries uh, like other African countries, and um, Sudanese people were is and were <laughs> are some of the most generous people. So okay. it, it really. I was really touched by how um, accepted we were. Like we were mm -hmm. like really integrated. There's no such a discrimination or, you know, they're just very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I assimilated right away. In fact, I learned the language immediately. So I, I was, was um, I was fluent within a year wow. of uh, the, uh, the Arabic, the Sudanese Arabic language. Just from, uh, did you take classes or just from No, they, just from every day, yeah. Okay, wow. You know, we were young, we were intermingling every day. We were, you know, we would just start for, you know, uh, new knowledge, you know, just accommodating, mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. You know, at a young age, I think, 
uh, you, you, like you're like a sponge, your mind is like a sponge, so you just absorb everything. And, and um, eventually I got a job at the American club, you know, owned by the American um, embassy, I think. Okay. And uh, uh, this club is uh, sort of like an international club uh, where lots of Europeans and other um, people from different countries belong. These are like uh, diplomats and other uh, probably NGOs and stuff like that, uh, where they hang out, where they eat. A social, social Yeah, trial. exactly. Okay. That were really um, opened, you know, my, you know, my my whole world because I was interacting the people from. Denmark, from Germany, uh, and mostly actually from America, you know, uh, 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 England, and all, you know, all kinds of stuff. Did so you already speak English? In high school, I was not bad, just a little bit. Okay. But I was learning more, and uh, um, uh, as I was working there, because it's required to speak, you know, somewhat, Got it. not necessarily fluently, but you know, you know, somewhat good, right. you know, English. Right. But then again, we're young, we're like, you know, just learning. You know, I was, you know, reading. Newsweek, the Time magazine, and I probably didn't understand about you know 80, 85 percent of you right. know what. But you know, you know, you uh, jot down all the you know all the vocabularies, just r like literally, it's like school. Yeah. So every day I go to the library, check out what they mean, and then reread it again, and awesome. you know, converse it, use some of it. Mm -hmm. Pronunciation was very difficult because you know uh, it wasn't spoken to me, so it was you know from reading. Just reading, yeah. Yeah. So that's how I learned, and eventually we got an, you know, uh, uh, an asylum from the United States government. Okay. So uh, when you say we, do you mean you and your? You said your my brother, brother, my you brother, and your brother. And I, yeah. Okay. My brother and I uh, got there uh, together. So uh, you know, we filed this process, you know, the, uh, you know, applying for refugee status through the American government, and we got accepted, and uh, they brought us to New Jersey. Oh, that was wow. the first, yeah, you know, uh, and then uh, when we got in 1986, I believe September, uh, got in in New Jersey. I think uh, place is called Newark. Uh -huh, Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, and uh, immediately uh, about uh, four months later, I moved to New York, and my first job in New York was working as a busboy at the. Uh, United Nations uh, building. Oh, wow. That yeah, was okay. a big Afro hair. And uh, I remember I, I used to get in trouble because I used to be, uh, you know, kind of like stopped, like, you know, people asking, where are you from? You know, like just very naive, you know, you know, just um, um, coming from, you know, Sudan and didn't know, you know, it's kind of uh, very polite, sweet, just very yielding. It's not like the New York style. Right. Get, get, get things done kind of stuff. The yeah. manager used to tell me, well, you know, people were asking him. I wanted to answer that, you know, that question, you know, politely, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Was that job at the UN, you said you were a busboy. A busboy, yeah. Was that your first kitchen job? Yes. Or restaurant? Well, okay. the first restaurant job. Okay. Yeah, the first restaurant job. And uh, like many other immigrants, I think it's uh, uh, the story of most immigrants. You come to this country. You go into the industry, uh, uh, in the, the service industry, mm -hmm. you know, mostly restaurant, hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, some went into uh, taxi driving, like my brother. Oh, uh, in uh, New York City? In or? New York City, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he drove taxi, I think, for like, I don't know, eight, nine years. Okay. Uh, now he's a teacher, actually. He's a, he teaches in a small university in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, you know, he went to school, went to graduate school, and but I'm jumping here. That's okay. Right yeah, look, take us back to the UN. I know. So, holy moly, that's a huge. I mean, what you did in Khartoum, I feel like was a small version of then. Then you go to the UN, and it's the UN. It's absolutely. All over the world. Yeah, absolutely. What's interesting about the UN is it the kind of people I was meeting. It just you know it's pretty international. It's the whole world. So I'm bound to be asked. You know, just being different there the way I dress, the way I walk, the way I interact with people. Mm -hmm. So it was actually quite fascinating, although the food is, in retrospect, now, you know, ha having lived in, um, in uh, San Francisco and having worked in those top restaurants, the food there was just kind of like a hotel, yeah. you know, kind of a deli-like, you know, just yeah. pretty, 
you know, straightforward, I, which is, you know, trying to cater for, you know, thousands of people yeah. around the world. So, but the experience was great because just meeting all the, you know, all the people, interacting, but I only worked about three, uh, three, four months there. Okay. And then a big change comes at the time. I had an American girlfriend okay. and we moved. Well, we came to visit San Francisco. What, what, uh, was it just purely vacation? What, what brought you to, to take a trip here? Well, the, uh, I had met uh, a, a girlfriend, like a, an American woman in Sudan while I was in Sudan. Okay. She was working in Sudan. Uh, she happened, she lived in, in the Bay Area. Surely, I, I don't know if she lived in San Francisco before. She lived in Sacramento before, and then okay. she knew a lot of people in the Bay Area. So we came to visit, you know, because she had a lot of friends in here uh, mm -hmm. in um, San Francisco. So we came to visit, and I completely fell in love, just the size of the city, the rolling. You know, it kind of reminds me of, actually, my hometown, Gondor, in oh. Ethiopia. Wow, okay. It's pretty hilly, you know, the uh, temperate, uh, uh, temperature, uh, smaller, and just the, the way of life was much slower, especially, you know, this is in the late 80s. I was going to ask, do you know what year? 86. 86, okay. Yeah. I arrived 86... Uh, November, I believe. Yeah. Had you been feeling at all homesick through, I, I know you left for a reason, but that doesn't mean you're not homesick or you, you know, you miss maybe the rest of your family or just the things you're used to. When you went to Sudan, then when you came to the U.S., were you, did you ever feel that? I was probably a little bit homesick when I first left Ethiopia to Sudan because, you know, the, uh, as a young person, that was the first time I left my family. Uh, especially my mother, I was so close to her. Right. But um, I'm also naturally um, inclined to move forward. I've okay. always uh, was interested in the other culture. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, I really never looked back once I came to the United States. So meaning I'm just like busy trying to learn, absorb the culture, trying to do all the logistical stuff in here. Mm -hmm. I was really kind of like a, a, a small child. I was so excited to be here, you mm -hmm. know, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was excited just in many ways, just in you know, the opportunities. Um, uh, at first, when I first came, I wanted to be an engineer because okay. I was uh, kind of good in science. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to study uh, uh, civil engineering. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I looked at all the possibilities you could do in here. And the plus the country, just all the parks, you know, the like when I first came, just going to uh, Napa, Sonoma, mm -hmm. and then going up north, you know, uh, it, it's just very exciting because you, we do not have that kind of luxury, mm -hmm. uh, both in um, Ethiopia and Sudan. Right. So uh, for that reason, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't homesick at all. I'm just right. excited to see more things here. Had you, um, we'll, we'll get to the to you deciding to move here in, in a minute, but I'm just wondering if you were able to travel anywhere else in the United States after you were already in New York? Well, uh, no, well, uh, because it was a short time. I, that oh. was still new. So I lived here probably uh, a year, like maybe nine months before I started traveling elsewhere. Oh, okay. Like uh, my girlfriend's, Parents were from Denver, Colorado. For mm -hmm. example, we went to Denver. Mm -hmm. uh, where else did we go? I think, the, uh, in terms of internally, it's mostly we went, of course, you know, uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, you know, that kind of stuff. It's uh, a, a touristy thing to yeah. to do. It's not my style now. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm more interested in more cultural uh, or nature kind of stuff you know, having lived in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, so, however, just speaking of traveling, um, in 1993, uh, uh, what was that, like uh, uh, three years later, went to the World Cup uh, in Italy. Uh, oh. Because I'm a big soccer fan, so yeah. I traveled in, a, uh, uh, in England and uh, Italy, you know, kind of extensively. Went for six weeks. Wow. So that was my first big uh, travel. And then thereafter, in, in the 90s, uh, we just, you know, experimented, you know, going to 
uh, New York again, uh, you know, uh, uh, other other places mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So can we talk about the decision to move here? I think the decision to move uh, here was uh, mostly the size of the city, the weather, just the people, and then the uh, first place we moved were in um, Bernal Heights, which is next to the mission. And um, I used to hang out the mission, you know, the mission cafes, uh, La Boheme, at, uh, in a 24th on mission. Back in the day, there was the Cafe Commons on uh, Presida and uh, Mission. Mm -hmm. It's no longer there anymore, but I, I just love the mission. You know, it's just the, the whole uh, uh, vibe and, you know, the slowness, you know, the shops, the, you know, the people, uh, you know, the art, the music was so, you know, uh, so beautiful. I just said, this is it. You know, this is like really beautiful. Especially 24th Street, right? Yeah, 24th Especially Street. 24th. You know, yeah. So uh, I think that that was the, the part of my decision. Okay, and then so you moved here. What year would that have been about? 86, 1986 oh. November. I moved there. Okay. So I, you could say just like eighty-seven. You know, I, I had lived here since November nineteen eighty-six. Okay. Uh, a few years in Bernal Heights, and then the rest of it in the mission until now. Okay. Yeah. What kind of things after you moved here? What kind of things were you were you doing? Oh, well, I went back to a, a restaurant job again. Uh, one of the first jobs I got in here was um, there was a, a restaurant called Cafe Majestic. Okay. Cafe Majestic was um, located, still is located, in fact, on 1500 Gough Street. Gough and uh, Sutter, I believe. Okay. Got that. At the time, it was owned by... Uh, famous uh, kind of restaurateur chef called Stanley Eichelbaum. Okay. Stanley Eichelbaum. In fact, that was one of the first uh, time I, I used to see James Beard, a famous, you know, James Beard sure. is a famous chef. He used to hang out there. Okay. Um, so that was my first job at the busboy. Stanley, um, who knew the Ethiopian culture, hired a lot of Ethiopians. Okay, got it. <laughs> he's, uh, you know, um, I think he's uh, probably, I don't know where he's from, but, you know, he's a, a Jewish, uh, you know, um, really, uh, he has a lot of stories to tell and stuff like that. So he really, uh, you know, uh, in fact, when I quit uh, a year later, he really called me like, no, come work, that kind of stuff. Mm. So that was my first job. And then followed by, Jeremiah Tower in 1991. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if you know the story of Jeremiah Tower. He's one of the um, great innovator of Californian cuisine. Yes. Uh, coming, let's, yeah, coming. Let's hear from, it though. Yeah, from coming you. from Japanese restaurant, mm -hmm. and um, in the in the 80s, I think he started his restaurant started uh, around. Uh, 86 probably and okay. then in the in the 80s in the late 80s and 90s he was the star of the city mm -hmm. you know just very uh, uh, one of the most successful restaurant you know flashy and the, you know all the you know uh, all the famous people the politicians you know they, they used to hang out there so I worked not at the stars but then the second restaurant he opened called Speedo 690 actually it's called 690 mm. okay I think it was on a, on a Van Ness and Turk or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was, that in fact was the first inspiration about food. Where you're cooking now. Yeah, uh, well, or, no, I wasn't cooking. I was a busboy still. Okay, Actually, okay. I was a food runner, mm -hmm. but, uh, but he used to teach some classes on Saturdays. So he asked me if I could help out with him. Oh. So when he was teaching, you know, um, kind of got interested in uh, uh, the food he was cooking, you know. It, uh, so I started cooking a little bit, experimenting in my home, what I was seeing visually there. Mm -hmm. I was not bad then in terms of just, you know, just you know, cooking from memory, you know, without recipes or anything like that. Of dishes from your homeland. Yeah, from, from him, is like, you know, whatever he was cooking, just like, you know, would, you know, just... Uh, trying to recreate that at home, okay. in, in, you know, and that was my first inspiration of food. So, you know, from you know, studying engineering in uh, City College, which I, I was about to finish, 
in the early 90s, mm -hmm. became very interested in food. Mm -hmm. And you credit, you credit him and, and what he was doing with that inspiration? Yes, absolutely. That, that, that's the initial inspiration. But immediately after that, I think uh, it closed down or something like that. So uh, in the early, I think it must have been 1992 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember I was so interested, so I was, you know, really like spending in libraries and, uh, you know, and cookware, like the mm -hmm. cellar and the messes, just, you know, just checking out all the cooking materials and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So one day I stumbled to another great chef called Joyce Goldstein. Mm -hmm. Joyce Goldstein, who had opened also uh, her restaurant called the Square One restaurant, I think, uh, I believe in the late 80s, maybe 88 or something like that. Okay. And um, so she was giving a seminar about Mediterranean cooking. Okay. So that was my first exposure about Mediterranean cooking. So I sat down and just listened to her and she was really uh, articulate and just extremely knowledgeable and uh, I was really inspired by her. So the next day I went and I applied at her restaurant. Yes. <laughs> this time, this time to, to cook. No, no, I, oh, I actually never just, cooked. I never cooked. It just, you know, uh, you just wanted to be, I in. just wanted to be in the restaurant, yeah. you know, like yeah. all my work was in the beginning at the time it was bad boy, but mostly, uh, I became a waiter then. Okay. I, I was just more like front of the house. I had become also managers, uh, in some of the restaurants. Um, but I never actually worked in a, um, in a kitchen or in oh, a restaurant. It was, was self-taught, which okay. I will come to. It. Sure. So uh, when I applied to George Goldstein, you know, I said, yeah, you could start at the Buzzboy. And, and I started there and then became a, a, a barback, you know, working in barback. And um, she was uh, probably my main inspiration uh, altogether because it just the knowledge she has, the style of her cooking, mm -hmm. her generosity, and you know, everything just like you just melted. You know, her kitchen was full of um, uh, cookbooks and you know uh, stories and all that stuff. So I used to just you know grab her you know cookbooks uh, and all the you know uh, used to read it just pretty much you know every week. So uh, she was she was my inspirer. That was Eskinder Azaged. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, Eskinder will pick up where he left off here, talking about branching out on his own culinary journey. Please join us for part two this Thursday. And in the meantime, our first batch of small business owners from past episodes is up on our website. So please check that out on the small business page. Music for Storied San Francisco is by Otis McDonald. Photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. The show is hosted and produced by me. Michelle and I have produced more than 120 episodes over the last three years, and you can find them all over at our website, storiedsf.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as just about everywhere you can listen to podcasts. Please subscribe to stay up to date on all the content we publish. And if you have any feedback for us, or you just want to say hi, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong, stay safe, and stay healthy.